Um, we've been planning tonight's topic for man, five, six, seven months ago, the beginning of the year, not knowing uh, that Brother Wright was going to be here, Bishop Wright was going to be here that last weekend, not knowing what he was actually going to talk about. And uh, so it was so, so cool to see how God does that, where then in preparation and building out tonight's lesson, it's like, well, man, that's perfect timing and lines up for exactly following what uh, Bishop Wright spoke about. And it's such a timely topic um, as well, right? Looking at how we effectively share our faith. Talking about everything we've been discussing before, about building up from where we are. What is the church? What is our purpose? What are we doing? How are we doing these things? What should we be doing in these capacities? And not only that, but then how does that directly relate to us as individuals? What is our part in that, in God's kingdom, in God's movement, and doing those processes? So really excited for tonight. We're going to be very practical tonight. We're going to talk about some specific examples. Right? We, we always talk about this in broad terms. And we always just assume that it's very easy to do. Um, we've all probably shared our faith at some point in some capacity. Maybe some of us more effectively than others. Um, maybe it's really easy for some of you. And maybe it's more difficult for others. Right, but understanding what is the mechanism and what tool set can we use in order to actually share our faith in a manner that it's actually received. Right, and so that's what we're gonna we're gonna jump into. But really focusing on right as Christians, we have responsibilities, and it, it's so cool too how just some of this lines up, and you'll see as we go through this. But we have responsibilities as Christians being witnesses, right? Having that life with Christ, having that relationship with God to extend beyond the walls of where we're at and really do His work and see His work. That's that. So everybody have the worksheet for today. All right, and I'm excited. Today's uh, class, we're going to have a little role play action a little later. So be ready to be engaged and active. Uh, everybody's going to get to participate in that. Uh, so, yes, very excited. Hold back the enthusiasm of the boy. Don't get too excited about that thing. Uh, but, uh, but it'll be good, I promise. I'll do my best to keep you awake. Right? But really the goal is to introduce various ways that we can witness and share faith. Uh, and as part of that understanding, it's our responsibility. So the first thing we want to talk about, open discussion again here, right, is what is the purpose of God's kingdom? Anybody? What is the purpose of God's kingdom? Share the news. To share good news. Yeah. I heard another one too. Fellowship. Fellowship. Right? Share good news. Fellowship. Heaven souls. Souls. What was the other one? Heaven. Heaven. Right? Bring heaven to earth. Right? God's kingdom. Bringing heaven to earth. God's reign to earth. Souls. Fellowship. Reaching, going, right? Exactly. Or if we want, if we want to break it down, right? it's evangelizing the lost and discipling them, thus expanding the kingdom of God. And it's so important, you know, when we pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Part of God's kingdom is bringing those attributes that God describes in a heavenly environment to earth. How is that possible? You can take a selfie, look in the mirror, right? That's us, as the kingdom of God, by evangelizing, by sharing our faith, we are evangelizing the lost, the souls. We're reaching out, we're bringing these people in, sharing the good news that God has done, sharing the gospel with them, and what that means and how it's impacted our lives directly. Yes. Right? And by doing that, it changes the present. Think about it, right? We say there's the there's the different there's the, the songs that says, oh well, well how is it gonna do God, how could you allow this to happen? You know, you're supposed to help, you're supposed to do it. It's like I did. I sent you. Right? That's us. That's our responsibility as Christians to share, to witness, to evangelize 
the lost that are going to hell, that are going to a place of eternal separation from God and try to share our experience that we have with them. So evangelize the lost and disciple them. And by doing that, it automatically expands the kingdom of God. All right. We've all heard the term. If you've been in church for a long time, whether if you've grown up in this, or you've been here for a couple of years, or maybe months, you've all heard the term soul winner. Man, that person is a soul winner. Right? What, they're a soul winner, and there's misconceptions about this in God's kingdom. Right? Often we believe that if we're untrained in specific aspects of ministry or outreach, that we can't be a soul winner. Oh, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to get to that level yet. I need to make sure that, that I pass all the CSTI courses, and I've got a year of Bible school down, and I've got my... No, 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 no. That's a misconception, right? The untrained... Now, now the untrained in ministry, right, opens the doors and areas for further development and growth. But the key is in how... If we outreach and we witness in the wrong way or the wrong capacity, it can actually be detrimental to the kingdom of God. Whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. But you just said anybody can do this. I don't have to be a certain level. That's right. But anybody can do it in a right way, and anybody can do it in a wrong way. Think, think of how you have conversations. Right? I could, I could say the exact same thing multiple ways and it mean different things. So I could say, man, Brother Andy, that's a black shirt. Or I could say, man, Brother Andy, that's a black shirt. Right? Just the way that I inflect my tone, the way that I have the conversation, it can mean either I like his shirt or I don't like his shirt by saying the exact same thing. Right, that's a, we had our um, uh, one of the executives at at work, uh, C level executive, chief, something officer, and they would always present, and it would drive me crazy, Sister Ronnie, because when they were presenting, they would say, "I'm just so excited about what's happening at the company. We have really great things taking place, and if you're not excited about it," You need to get understand what's actually happening. And I'm like, just what? Like, just again. Like, I keep waiting for that. Ha ha! Just kidding. Yeah, let's get excited. But, but just the context where I, I couldn't get excited. I actually was getting mad. Well, she was right. We should be excited. It was amazing stuff happening and product and marketing and all these things. But I was so distracted by it. Is so exciting. I mean, no inflection, no faith. You couldn't tell. So excited about what is happening. Okay, we can really get behind that. Who's going to get behind that, right? It's the same way in our conversations. And I'm getting a little, little ahead of myself here in the notes. But think about it. When you're at work or you're at a place, the person that's always like, man, you're like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to ask them. I've only got five minutes on my break, so I'm not going to ask them how their day's going. <laughs> We're laughing because we know it's true. It's like, okay, well, hey, okay, look at, oh, there's Bob over there. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. We know how Bob's day is, right? But, th but when you put it in that perspective, if I know that that individual that's always down in the dumps, that's always, man, life's so tough right now, everything's so difficult, I know they go to church, and I know... Sally over here that has a smile on her face every day, even when her car breaks down and she can't stop talking about how good God is. If, if me as an unsaved believer, I have a need and I know that they both go to church, who am I going to reach out to? If I know nothing else about them, I don't know what they believe. I just know they both go to church and proclaim to be Christians. I'll tell, I'm going to be talking to Sally, not Bob. Right? If, if, if his church is giving him that, oh, man, well, my relationship with God, oh, you know, we, it was, it's terrible. We had, and when I was in youth and hyphen, and Jesus has forgiven us, uh, uh, me and my buddies, there was another individual. We called her Eeyore. <laughs> because everything, all the time, it was just down in the dumps. And it's a beautiful day today. 
Yeah, well, it's supposed to rain tomorrow. <laughs> well, that's cool. We need some water. Well, there'll probably be flash floods. I was like, no matter what, could spin it. But that's the context in what we're doing, right? The same way, well, Jesus loves you. Hey, I just want to tell you Jesus loves you. That's great. And then they're in a meeting with you, and you lie, or you cheat, or you do something on a project. It doesn't matter what you're saying. What? Oh, I thought you were, I thought you were trying to say Right? But there is a misconception. Yes, anybody can witness and do it, but there is a way, there is a better way to do it than others. And so we're going to talk about some of these areas and these errors, uh, and we're going to discuss them a little bit because I've been guilty of them. And whether or not you want to admit you have, that's up to you and, and Jesus, and I'll leave it there, but I know I have. The first one is being too aggressive. Right? Being too aggressive. One's friends and family are not usually won by telling them how wrong they are. I have unsaved family, unsaved loved ones. I don't go in there and I'm like, man, hey, guess what? You better get fixed because you're a sinner and you're a terrible human. Even if that's the reality. They may know that and think that about themselves, but I can't go in and aggressively do that and pursue it in that capacity. Right? We have to use common sense. Proverbs 11 and 30. Okay, Proverbs 11 and 30 tells us that he who winneth souls is wise. He who winneth souls is wise. I think that has two separate applications, right? The first application being, if you're a person that's winning souls, that's a very wise, wise thing that you're doing because that's fulfilling this great commission that we've been talking about. That's fulfilling our role as a church. But at the same time, if I'm winning souls, I must be wise in my execution of my witness. Right? So we're going to look at this in, in, in both ways. Being too aggressive, going in hard, right? When you first meet somebody or you have that talk or you pray with them, it's not, hey, yeah, let's go, let's do this right now. Oh, you need to repent right now. They may be, someone may be receptive to that, but that's where you're going to have to use your common sense as well to judge the conversation. A second error that we see is fearfulness and timidity, right? Everybody needs, this is so important, everybody needs and wants what you have experienced it. Regardless of if they know they need it or not. But what happens so many times is our fear is overcome, right? Our, our fear of sharing is overcome by being involved in some area of ministry. So how do I get over this to start with? You know what a great way to get over being afraid of witnessing and sharing? Start teaching Sunday school. Volunteer to teach Sunday school. Volunteer to help. Any ministry where you're talking about God, what He's doing, what His relationship is, how He's impacted you, whether it's greeting people at the front door, any ministry involvement you can do where it gets you the motions of speaking about what God has done for you, about what God can do for you, all of these are going to help better empower you and enable you to be more successful in your ministry. And what happens when we're more comfortable in something? We're less afraid of it. Right? Fear is typically related to the unknown. That's why people are afraid of so much because they don't understand it or they don't know it. So they're afraid of it. So by us being familiar with not just our personal experience, but being able to articulate our personal experience empowers us then to step away from fear and operate from a place of faith. Come on in. Yeah, welcome. There should be some uh, papers on at the seats already. If we need more, we can get them. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says this, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Right? So God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. We should not be operating in fear. We need to be able to operate in faith instead. The, second, the third error that we see Right? And, and this is one, actually, Bishop Wright hit on this as well. is a misconception of what a witness is. Right? Think a witness tells what he or she knows. What he or she has experienced. Right? A witness can only articulate what they've experienced and what they personally know. I can't be a witness for what's happened at Smarty for you today. I have no idea. 
Only you can be a witness of what you've seen, what you've done, what you've read, what you've learned. That's all on you in that capacity, right? One may not know everything, but we can witness about our own experience. Well, I can't quote the whole plan of salvation. That's okay. I don't know every scripture to get them from point A to point Z. That's okay. Have your sins been forgiven? Were you a terrible person before you came to God? Or a good person before you came to God? Right? You can relate it in your experience so it makes sense. And that's what's most important because if it's personal, it's going to connect. Your personal story. And that's why each and every one of us is so unique and different. And our stories are unique and different. So you're going to be able to connect to people that I'm not. You're going to be able to share your testimony, your witness with them, and they're going to be able to relate to it, where if I shared mine in the best capacity, they could acknowledge it, okay, that's fine. But if they can connect with you, you're going to connect with people. Sister Anna, you're going to connect with people that I'm not able to connect with. And, and, and every single one of us, Sister Seven, there's going to be people that only you can connect with. Only your witness is going to get through to them. And that's the opportunities that we can't be afraid to take advantage of those opportunities when they present themselves. And just saying, I don't know, every biblical step is not justification for not sharing your witness. You have a personal experience, and regardless of if you can quote every scripture that supports it, you can look it up later, and we'll give you, you got the notes, so we can give you book, chapter, and verse for everything, but you can still, at that moment, share your personal experience, right? And that is your witness. In John chapter 4, think about this. John chapter 4, we hear about the story of the Samaritan woman, right? Brother Ronnie, remember this? The Samaritan woman at the well. God goes and talk to her. God goes around a, dis a whole series where he reveals who he is to this Samaritan woman. Through her questions. Through her reaction. She has no, no understanding. She's not growing the scriptures. But what happens to her entire village? Anybody? She goes and tells the gospel who was. Yeah, they all come to Jesus because she shares what? For the mark. Her testimony, her experience, her witness, a perfect example, right? She wasn't a theologian. She wasn't, they didn't meet her at the, the synagogue, right? We know the context of her background. We don't know all of it, but we know that was not her first husband, her second husband, her third husband, right? And we know the person that she was wasn't even her actual husband. If somebody's disqualified, but after an experience with God, she shares that with this entire village, and it says that they all came to see the man that had done this. Okay? Um, so the misconception of what a witness is, remember, that's a witness of your experience. Number four, the lack of knowledge or resources, right? There are times when one will be asked questions that should be asked, answered in an effective and knowledgeable way, right? There are times that that happens. Not always, though, does it happen in a, a, or we can't always do it through personal application. So you're going to get asked a question that you may not have personally experienced, right? And that's where it says, oh, okay, well, there's a gap here. There's something that needs to be done here. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready to give an answer. But when? Be ready always. To give an answer to the to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and with fear. So First Peter encourages one to be ready to answer questions. Now, there's nothing wrong with somebody asking you a question the first time and you can't answer it. All right, that that happens to us. There's some I'll be talking to somebody and they'll say something and I'm like, yeah, let me get back to you on that. Right, so I can take that away, and that's fine. That's a reasonable, all right, I'm going to go and research this. But the next time we get asked that question, we better have an answer. Right, and that's, that the, 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 the Bible is telling us here, hey, yes, things are going to happen. You may not know, but you need to be ready. And if somebody's asked you once, it's your responsibility to go study that out and find the answer. So the next time you get asked, you're ready to give that answer. That uh, 1 Peter 3.15 tells us. Alright? So you don't want to get caught without the answer the second time. 
Now, the Bible gives an example of what we've talked about, right? Of, of someone sharing their experience. And we see that in the story of Andrew, right? The disciple Andrew in John chapter 1, verse 35 through 42. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i go ahead and read this for us. And it says this. If you want to turn there, that's fine. I'm going to read it. It says, Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he has said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them follow him and said, do, do, do. Sorry, I want to make sure. Yes, okay. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What seek ye? So these were two of John's disciples, right? And John's there and he says, hey, this is the, there's the Messiah, that's Jesus, that's the one that you want to follow. And so they leave John and they start following Jesus. And he says, well, hey, what are you doing? Why are you following me? And we see here it says, right, uh, saying to him, Rabbi, which is to say the interpret master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and they abode with him that day. So they follow him, they see where he's staying, and they stay with him that day. For it's about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him, him being Jesus, was Andrew. Okay, so the disciples that leave John, one of them is Andrew. And he's heard, right, John has said who Jesus is. So now he knows, he has a revelation of who Jesus is, of what that is. Jesus has told him, hey, come abide with us. So Andrew's following him. Now it's so important because what we see... Uh, Andrew do. Now, Andrew was Simon's brother, uh, Simon Peter's brother. Verse 41, ready? It says, He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So Andrew, now, once he's found, John has said, here's the Messiah. He's followed Jesus. He goes with him, right? And now Andrew is saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to go get my brother. And he says, he goes and he finds his brother, Simon Peter, and says, hey, we found the Messiah. This is him. This is the Christ. He doesn't just stay there, but he goes and gets somebody to bring them with him in this experience. And verse 42 says, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which by interpretation is a stone. Andrew left where Jesus was to go get Simon. Andrew was able to share his experience and his knowledge to bring somebody else into a relationship with Jesus Christ. All right. Andrew followed Jesus. Andrew found Peter, his brother, and Peter and Andrew fellowship with Jesus. So be that the, the fill in the blanks there. Andrew followed Jesus. Andrew found Peter, his brother, and Peter and Andrew fellowship with Jesus. What a pattern. A very easily repeat, <coughs> excuse me, repeatable pattern. Follow, find, fellowship. Right? Very easy pattern. So, there's six definite things that can help us be successful soul winners. That's what we're going to focus on. I want to define here definite, right? This is clearly stated or, desi or, or decided. It's not vague. It's not doubtful. So these are going to be definite things that we're going to be deciding as individuals in order for us to be successful soul winners. All right? The first one is definite power. Right? We want to pray for God's leadership and help in spreading your testimony. Prayer should be part of your constant effort of personal outreach. Holy Ghost power precedes witnessing power. Right? It's the same way. Think about it. When we get out of church and we've had an awesome service and you're on fire, it's a lot easier to go out and talk about what God's done. That's why your personal prayer life is so important. Because by our own, right, I can be shy, I can be timid, and I can see somebody and maybe the Lord saying, oh, go talk to Sister Berta. Tell her about, tell her about Jesus. Right? 
have her teach you a Bible study. The more that I'm engaged with God, the more that in my prayer life is established, if I'm praying and I'm full of the Holy Ghost and the power of the Holy Ghost, we read earlier, right? God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power. That power is what enables us to put, to go over our meekness, to go over our timidness, to go over our shyness, and to share our witness with somebody. So we pray that God gives us that power, definite power, not our power, but God's power, the power from the Holy Ghost, the only power that keeps us from temptation, right? The only power that can separate us from addiction, that's this power. The second one is a definite time to go. Lifestyle evangelism is the most powerful type of outreach, right? What did I, what did we talk about? That's living the actual Christian walk because people are watching you. Your family, your friends, those closest to you, they know. You can profess to be a Christian all you want. But how you act, you can't hide it from them. If you want to witness to your family, the lifestyle approach is what's going to do it. I'm going to live, I'm going to talk, I'm going to act in a way that supports what I'm saying. Right? Because we can come and you can tell them, oh, it's great, we know friends, maybe family members, maybe co-works. Oh, yeah, you're a Christian too? That's great. And then they turn around and drop an F-bomb in a conversation. Right? Or they're at Friday night happy hour drinking with everybody else. Oh, yeah, man, Jesus loves you. What's different? Okay, well, man, there's something different about Andy, though. I wonder what it is. Oh, and he doesn't go to happy hour. Oh man, he, everybody else got mad when this happened, and he didn't. Right? The lifestyle is a choice. They see because that's the biggest thing. Because look, family, we don't we can't hide from family. Right? And the biggest witness we talked about it as an extended family. But whether you're you're a well, we're all a child of somebody. We've seen it growing up, where we see our parents, we see how they act. We incorporate that as parents. We have to try to be an example. But not just that. Everybody in a church capacity, at work, everybody is watching you. Regardless of if you say, hey, I'm a Christian. Right? It's going to be much more important when they look at you and say, Sister Martha, Martha what's up with Martha? She's, di she's different. She's always got a smile on her face. Like, I, I know that there's like crazy stuff going on, but she's just like, yeah, hey, what's up? How are you? Today's good. I'm good. Right, but when we talk about the love of God, we have to be able to show that in our closest relationships. God loves you so much, He's willing to die for you. And then you kick the kids when you get home from work because it's a bad day. <laughs> or, or, right, that's an extreme. But we can't really confess that, and that's why it's so important that we have that definite power inside of us. Because that's the only way that we can control that. That's the only way that we can have this lifestyle application that I'm talking about right here. Because otherwise, if it's only on us, we're not going to do it. It is the most powerful type. Lifestyle evangelism is the most powerful type of outreach that we can do. But most of us need a concentrated time to go into evangelistic efforts. Right? What, do I, what do I mean by that? That means, yes, we're doing this as a lifestyle. That's what we call the long game, the slow game, the, the long play where it is we're showing Christ through our actions. We're showing Christ through how we love those that don't treat us right. We're showing Christ at work when the person lies about us and we handle it in the way that their mind explodes. Right? They're, they're trying to antagonize. Oh, I'm going to see how mad I can get, I get Sister Sheila today. Let me see. I'm going to lie about her and get her in trouble. And then how Sister Sheila is able to handle that situation through the power of the Holy Ghost in her relationship with God. Man. That's no fun. She didn't get mad. She just handled it and it was okay. Right? These are, these are lifestyle evangelism. But sometimes we need to focus one that says, hey, let's meet at the church on Sunday and let's go talk to people about Jesus. Right? That's important. That's why when we have those, whether it's for children's stuff, whether it's for um, uh, Easter events or whatever, whenever there's an opportunity for us to be focused, and specific lifestyle evangelism, you live that every day. But we need to look for opportunities for a time to go 
meet at this time, let's go talk to this audience. And when we pray from that first part of the power, God can meet us and direct us in those capacities. So we need both. It's not just, oh, I'm just going to live my life the right way and, and never tell anybody or never invite anybody to, to have a conversation about God because they're just going to see through my life. Right? It's a balance of both. We need to be able to do, to do both. Uh, we need definite love to show to a definite project. Right? We know John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. <clears throat> so many times we do that as what? The world, right? Everything out there. We need to have that conversation. That, For God so loves my neighbor Barry. Right? Practical applications. God loves your neighbor in apartment D so much that he died for them just as much as the individual in China that's going through persecution. And God so loves the world, yes, including your neighbor, including the person that sits at your table at school, including your coworker that's in the cubicle behind you or the one that's on shift after you. Right? We have to take this broader picture and focus it specifically on where we're at. Think of it now. What's your neighbor's name? <clears throat> uh oh. What's your neighbor's name? Tom. Thank you. We got one Tom. Right? Ruth, Fred, Kenny, yes. Kenny Ann, uh, Sean, uh, Sean. Anybody. Oh yeah, uh, Bill, uh, his wife. Those are all really good, really good names, right? But that's God died for them. God died for each and every one of them, and that's amazing that you have that because they, if you know their names and that many, they should, you should, they should already be seeing your lifestyle of evangelism and your lifestyle of witness. So at what point then are we able to say, okay, now let's focus on that, right? Effective soul winners. Here's the thing. You're not going to hit a target if you don't know what you're aiming for. <coughs> right, there's the saying that says, you're always going to get, if you don't know where you're going, you're always going to get there. We need to be focused <laughs> in what we're doing. Effective soul winners say, you know what? Out of that list of 12 people, Sister Randy, I'm going to focus on Bosch. And I'm going to be intentional about this next month. I'm going to be intentional about finding an opportunity to share my witness with God. Or whoever it is in your community. If it's at school, if it's at work, wherever that capacity is, right? Being intentional with who you're going to reach about the gospel. The next one is we need a definite seed to sow. What are you going to communicate? How are you planning to communicate it? Oh, I'll figure it out when I get there. Okay, God can give you the power to give you the words to say at that moment. He's done that. We see it. But it's always good for us to have a plan in place as well. What are we going to say, right? People who succeed in evangelism can give you an answer to both of those questions. What are you going to say and how are you going to do it? Right, because you work where you're selling software and you're proving value. You have an audience. You know going into that what you're going to show to them and how you're going to show it to them. If you don't, you're not going to close the deal. They're not going to buy the product. Right? Having that audience of knowing what I'm going to communicate and how I plan to communicate it is key. And that's how for each and every one of you. When we're doing this to be proactive. And we need a definite plan to know. Memorize your testimony. It's your life. It shouldn't be too hard for some of us. Maybe like it might be a little harder. Sometimes I can forget all the, the details from the beginning. But memorize your testimony. Memorize a pattern for showing people the Bible purpose for your experience with God. So hey, I'm going to tell you about my testimony. I just memorized my testimony. But now I'm actually going to share with you all those scriptures that explain what my testimony just said about me coming to church and, and feeling convicted and I needed to be there and then coming in and, and raising my hands and asking God to take my sins away and all of a sudden speaking in a totally different language and then getting baptized in Jesus' name after service. Right? If that's my experience and my testimony, but now being able, oh yeah, it was crazy. It was just like they said in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Right? And, 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 and baptizing and being able to provide these scripture texts that are there. 
initially, you can mark it in your Bible as a change reference plan. And what we're actually going to do here in just a minute is exactly that. Okay? So we need a path to follow through. And this is most important. If we effectively follow up with those that we are in contact with, we're going to get much better results. That's that last fill in the blank right there. If we effectively follow up, following up is key. But now, your definite plan to know. All right, we're going to take time right now. I'm going to give you at least five minutes. And what we're going to do is you're actually going to write out your personal testimony in the space on the paper. If you flip, flip to the next page, you should see the lines. You're going to write your personal testimony detailing how you came to God. So you're going to take time now. If you need a pen, we've got pens up here. But go ahead and write it out. You should have enough pens. If you don't have a pen, you haven't been filling in all your blanks, so don't tell on yourself. Uh, but we can get you another one as well. But take the time right now to start filling that out. We're going to give it just about five minutes. Write out your personal de testimony detailing how you came to God. I'll give us a, some a music. We can play a, a song in the meantime.
30 seconds. Maybe paraphrase a little bit if you need to. cover because I've got, we've talked about this journey, we've talked about this process of having a biblical dream. That's what I want to share next with us. A proven step and a methodology that we can use, a pattern for easily explaining the gospel. Okay, so I'm going to try to go through it quickly, but if you can hang with me just a, just a little bit here. It's called the road to salvation. And we start in Romans chapter 3 verse 23. Okay, Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right, so when we get into explaining this, we, we all think, we say, we do evil things because of our sinful nature. Sin is simply anything that separates us from a pure and holy God. I can think of some things that I've done that I know I was wrong. Can't you? Right? So we're looking at verse, application, and how we can communicate this. So easy way to start, Romans 3.23, right? All have sinned. Next, we can move from there from Romans 3.23 to Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23, right? So 3.23, we said, hey, we've all sinned. Now in Romans 6.23, we tell what happens if you sin. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? As we receive wages on the job for what we do, so we're going to receive wages for sin. Death is separation in this life and the hereafter. Revelations 20 and 12 through 15 speaks of the second death. It says in Revelation 20 verse 12, I'll read it for you. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the dead in hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were all judged, every man according to their works. Verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So Romans 3 tells us we've all sinned. Romans 6 tells us that because of our sin we deserve death, but God can give us eternal life through Jesus Christ. If we look then in Romans 5, verse 8, it says, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us in our place where you are at now. Right? It says if we're sentenced to death for a crime that we've committed, you did it. You, there's no doubt. You did the crime. You're sentenced to death. And before you walk into that execution chamber, an innocent person says, hey, you know what? I'm going to take your place. That's, that's pretty heavy, right? Our salvation is a possibility only since Christ died for us and in our stead. Amen. And then from Romans, we move to Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 38. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of... Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When the people Peter was speaking to realized Jesus Christ was the Lord and died for them, they felt sorry for their sins. Why? Why did they feel sorry? Why did it matter that Peter told them, hey, Jesus was the Messiah? Why did it matter to the Jews right there? Yeah, 
Acts of birth. They're the ones that crucified him. They just crucified the Messiah. And Peter says, do you guys know what you just did? And they get convicted of it. They feel that conviction, that draw. And so they say, what do we need to do? Because, yeah, we messed up. And he first tells them to repent, to turn from sin and to God. Right? And this is the hard part for us. So many of us is right, it's, it's closing that cell. Right? We've now talked about everybody being a sinner. What happens when we sin? How do we get out of our sinful state? God dying for us, coming to this point. We need to repent of our sins. Right? If we want to lead somebody, this can be a conversation. I started this conversation four minutes ago. In four minutes, we've gone through why we need to be, why, what, what state we're in, where we're at, what we need to go, and we're at repentance in four minutes. This is a conversation you can have while you're getting a, a coffee break. This is a conversation you can have in the hallway between walking to classes. This is a conversation you can have anywhere. Okay? The conversation may go something like this. Oh, this is Mary, I'll use Bob again. Hey, Bob. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord and that he died for you? Man, I feel sorry for my sins when I think of Jesus dying for me. Don't you? Are you willing to give control of your life to God? Would you like to right now? Right? In prayer and preparation, we review. you can review the scriptures with him. When you pray, you can pray the scriptures with him. You can lead them through the prayer. It doesn't have to be an extremely long prayer. Right? We're talking about a prayer of repentance right here. We're not saying you're necessarily praying them through to the Holy Ghost in that specific time, but a prayer of repentance, a place of repentance. Right? That's a simple prayer that you can pray together, holding your hand through these scriptures. God, I'm a sinner. I recognize I've sinned, and because of my sin, I deserve to die and go to hell and be separated from you. But I realize that you died for me. And because I realize that I am convicted in my spirit, I'm sorry for the sins that I've done to do that, and I want to repent of my sins before you today, Jesus, and make my heart right before you. That's a quick conversation. We can do it. Oftentimes, they don't know how to pray, but we can guide them. And then that's where we come into Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. It says, And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and what shall with it shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whosoever thou shalt lose, or whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. After asking for the important decision and praying with them, ask if they've repented. If they say yes, right, then we can explain, that's great. That's only the first step in the plan of salvation. Now you should be baptized in Jesus' name and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and you can go over Acts 2.38 again. Right? But I point out, it's not uncommon for people to say no. Is that, that's in the ideal world, but like, you're right, it is. It's not going to go that easy. But it might. We don't know everybody's situation or the circumstances, right? And so that's where learning, memorizing, practicing, and using this method or a variation of this method, right? These are the steps that have just been lined out. How does your testimony that you just wrote down align with these steps? Can you use these steps? to support the different areas in your personal experience and salvation with God? That's an easy application, right? And when we tell somebody, if somebody says no, you can say, hey, I totally understand. I respect your decision. If you ever decide to give your life to Jesus, you know he loves you. You can be found through repentance, baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost. It leaves the door open for further discussions while still respecting and being respectful. We don't want to be over aggressive. We talked about that before, right? Knowing the situation, using common sense. But being able to articulate this in four minutes, three minutes, right? At, at work, we have what we call the elevator pitch. If you've ever worked in sales, you know about this elevator pitch. You need to be able to, the idea is you get on the elevator at the first floor with the customer, and you need to be able to speak value to them and explain what your business does and why they need to be a customer before they get off on their floor. We should have an elevator pitch for the gospel. Here's an example plan, right? Quick way, how can you describe the gospel? How can you describe a plan of salvation, why they need it in two minutes? And with time, we're right there. That was kind of the, the plan is we were going to break out and actually have you do that uh, and just compare that. But what you'll see in the actual worksheets, 
you'll notice if you look in the worksheets, there's a couple of key things in the worksheet specifically. One is to go through your Bible and mark out all these steps on the plan of salvation, the road to salvation that I just laid out here. Right? It's really easy. You can put a tab on Romans 6, or excuse me, 328. Right there, you have the scripture, and then on that tab, it tells you where to go to the next one, and you have the next one tabbed out. So from Romans 3.28 to 6.28, and then from 6.28 to 5.8, right? So you can have this very quickly where you can jump through on that plan, and it's very easy to follow. Start that way, but then this is something that you can memorize and be able to incorporate into your witness. Because now, you already have your personal witness. You have your testimony, Sister Anna. Brother Ronnie, you have, you know your testimony inside out because you lived it. Now you have the scriptures in a quick, easy, clean, concise way to support, I was convicted in my heart, I was wrong. Here's what that means because the Bible explains what it means. This is why I had to repent. This is how I was then filled with the Holy Ghost and why I got baptized in Jesus' name. So well, the idea is to leave you with something tangible tonight that you can actually take out of here and use tomorrow. And do you need to have it all memorized tomorrow? No. But am I going to give you a pop quiz in two weeks? Maybe. Yes. Right? But, but having this as a practical tool empowers you to be effective in your witness. Because as we know, the responsibility of a mature Christian is to share our witness with a lost, hurt, and dying world. So the, the exercise, we were actually going to break out and practice with each other, but I know we're already at time, so I appreciate you sticking with me. Um, if you want to stay and do some role play, we can, uh, we can do that, but if you need to go, feel free to, to be dismissed. Can, make sure you signed in. Uh, you also know this, I took some, somebody had asked to have lines added into the enrichment exercise, so I put some lines on there help you write out your enrichment exercise and answer those questions but make sure you do that apply it and um, yeah thanks for your time and we look last two weeks is our final session so try to bring in you'll have time after that but if you haven't turned in enrichment exercises from other classes get those if you need copies talk to sister today or brother omar or myself let us know which ones you need and we will get them to you so you have them okay any questions? Anything tonight? All right. Thank you. Have a good night.